Welcome, everyone. This is Stephen from Stephen Woodward Ministries. And the teaching that I'm going to do is called Explosion. Part one, the resurrection power in you. Okay, so let's get on to the first scripture here. The first scripture I have is 2 Peter 1, 3. Seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. Through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. So what I want you to see here is that it's that his divine power has granted to us everything. It's his divine power. But here's the key. It's pertaining to life and godliness, and it comes through the true knowledge of him. You have to have the true knowledge of him. All right. That true, that, um, that divine power is granted to you. But unless you have the true knowledge of him, you're not going to have that full amount of the divine power. You're not going to understand that it's been granted to you. You're going to be trying to earn it and trying to get it. And you're going to try to figure out how it works and how do I do this? And you have to know him. Let's look at the, uh, the scripture in the Passion Translation. It says, Everything we could ever need for life and godliness has already been deposited in us by his divine power. So right there, everything that we could ever need for life has already been deposited in us by his divine power. But if you don't know him, you're not going to know that it's there. And it goes on to say, for all this has lavished upon us through the rich experience of knowing him who has called us by name and invited us to come to him through a glorious manifestation of his goodness. Okay. For all this was lavished upon us. And how does that get lavished upon us? It says through the rich experience of knowing him. Okay. And he calls us by name. He knows us so intimately that he knows us by name, okay? But we have to have that rich experience of knowing him. That's the key. You can have all the power in the world, but if you don't know that you have it, then it doesn't do you any good. So I have here, I, I put deposited in us by his divine power, okay? I put that he created us with it. It's in our nature. We then experience it and release it by knowing him intimately. Okay. So when we were created in Christ, we were created with that divine power, with his nature, right? With his essence of who he is, right? So it says in, um, it's in our nature. We, now we have to experience it and release it. And we do that by intimately knowing him. Okay, so let's take a look at this a little bit deeper. So the word divine in Greek is 2304, and it means manifesting the characteristics of God's divine nature, ties God's essence to his self-manifestation, permitting all people to know him by observing his attributes. So this is what happens when you sit and you um, are in stillness, and you become aware of him. It says to be still and know that I am God. So you be still, okay? And you're manifesting the characteristics of his divine nature because he's in you, right? Because you're one with him. You're manifesting him. You're manifesting self-manifestation, right? And he has permitted all people to know him by observing his attributes, okay? So this is very, very important. This is very important for you to understand this concept that you have his divine nature in you and you manifest that by being aware of it, okay, by faith. Let's look at the word power. In the Greek, it's 1411 and it's dunamis, which we get the word dynamite from, okay? Um, properly, it means ability to perform, Power to achieve by applying the Lord's inherent abilities. Power through God's ability. And it goes on to say that inherent power, 
power residing in a thing by virtue of its nature or which a person or thing exerts and puts forth. Okay, so I just said here that it's by his nature. Manifesting the characteristics of God's divine nature. Okay, and I put here that deposited in us by his divine power, he created us with it. It's our nature also. Okay, so for the power, inherent power residing in a thing by virtue of its nature. So we have that power in us. Okay, and it's dunamis. It's like dynamite. And it has the ability to preform the power through God's ability. You can preform things through God's power, through his ability, because you carry him in you. You, you are one with him. You carry his power. It's so important to understand that this is not something that's outside of you, that you have to, um, to get something. All his power is within you. Okay. And all you have to do is release that, but you have to have that intimate knowing of him before you can ever even understand that power that it's in you. Okay. So let's go on here. Let me show you some scriptures that talks a little bit more about it. Philippians 3.10 says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. Okay. So the, the part I want you to focus on here, it says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, the power that resurrected him. Okay. Let's look at the passion translation. It says, and I continually long to know the wonders of Jesus and to experience the overflowing power of his resurrection working in me. I will be one with him in his sufferings and become like him in his death. So let's look at the beginning again. It says, and I continually, okay, long to know the wonders of Jesus and to experience, okay? That, there's that word experience again, that he wants to experience his overflowing power of the resurrection working in him. He's acknowledging that the power is working in him and he wants to experience that with overflowing, okay? So let's look at the next scripture here. 2 Peter 1, 2. Now, this is the scripture before the one I started with, which was uh, 2 Peter 1, 3. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. So here it's talking about how the knowledge of God, right, Grace and peace gets multiplied to you by understanding and knowing the knowledge of God. Okay, let's look at it in the Passion Translation. 2 Peter 1, 2 in the, in the Passion Translation, it says, May grace and perfect peace cascade over you as you live in the rich knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Okay, so here it's talking about the perfect peace that it may cascade over you. As you live, right? You have to live in the rich knowledge of God. You have to have that rich knowing, that rich knowledge of him within you. And then that power, that divine power will flow, okay? So let's look at what the word knowledge means. The word knowledge in Greek is 1922, and it says knowledge gained through firsthand relationship. Properly contact knowledge that is appropriate, apt, fitting to firsthand experiential knowing. Okay, so do you think that the disciples had that firsthand relationship with him? They had contact knowledge. So in the scripture here, it says, may grace and perfect peace cascade over you as you live in the rich knowledge of God. Okay, that rich knowledge, that rich firsthand relationship. That's why it's a personal relationship with Jesus, because you have to know him. Okay, and it becomes that firsthand gain through that firsthand relationship with him. It's contact knowledge. That's where the personal relationship um, comes into play. The personal relationship that I have with Jesus is going to be different than what you have with Jesus, because it's personal to you. 
and your personality and your characteristics and who you are and where you've lived and where you've come from and the things in the places you're going. All of that is personal. Okay. And you're going to have that contact knowledge. You have to have that firsthand relationship with him to experience that multiplication of grace and peace in your life. Now, it says here that it's experiential knowing. So let's look at the word experiential in the dictionary. It says experiential means relating to, derived from, or providing experience empirical. Okay. So again, here we see that word experience, okay? You have to experience Jesus. The disciples experienced him, right? They slept under the stars with him, okay? They ate with him. They walked with him, right? They did everything with him, okay? And so that's an empirical experience. So let's look at what the word empirical means. Empirical in the dictionary it means originating in or based on observation or experience, or it means relying on experience or observation alone, often without due regard for system and theory. So the disciples didn't have theory about Jesus, or they didn't have some sort of a system that they came up with about Jesus, okay? They were strictly relying on experiential knowing and observation. So when Jesus was walking out the kingdom and he was demonstrating the miracles, okay, they were observing those things. They were experiencing those things firsthand. So they had a personal relationship with him. They had that contact knowledge that it talks about here in the, uh, the word knowledge for Greek. They had that knowledge of gain through firsthand relationship with him, okay? And that's the same thing that we have because we do that through the spirit, okay? We don't have him in physical form, but we have that contact knowledge and that personal relationship with him in the spirit. And that's very important to understand that we don't have a physical relationship with Jesus, okay? We have that spiritual knowing. It's the knowing on the inside. It's the inner man. We're one with him, okay? So let's go on um, to pass the empirical part. And I, I mentioned intimacy a couple of times. So let's look at what intimacy means in the dictionary. It means um, marked by a warm friendship developing through long association. And it also means of a very per, uh, personal or private nature. So again, the disciples had that. They had a very warm friendship that uh, developed over a long period of time was a long association. They were they were with him day in and day out for three years, okay? They experienced every emotion with him, right? In the boat when they were going to, when they thought they were going to sink, um, when the fish got multiplied, they experienced all sorts of things with him. And it's a very personal and, uh, and private nature. Many times in the scriptures, it talks about how he would tell the disciples things that he didn't tell anybody else. And mostly that was around the parables. He was explaining the parables to them in private, okay? So they had private information, very personal information that he would share with them, okay? So let's go to the next scripture here. John 14, 6 says, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. OK, so Jesus is saying here that he's the only way to the father, but it only comes through knowing him. It comes through union with him. OK, again, the disciples had that. The disciples had that experiential knowing, that personal relationship, right, that intimacy with him. And so they came into union with him when they were with him. And I put here that. Awareness by faith. You are aware of him, knowing him based on who he says he is, and you experience him by faith. It's a heart-to-heart -heart experience relationship. Unity, unified, become one. So the disciples, like I mentioned, they knew him in the physical form, right? They walked with him. They talked with him. They ate with him. They did all sorts of things with him, okay? But we, on the other hand, now we experience him by awareness, by being aware of him, by spiritual knowing and by faith. And I just touched on that a minute ago. 
But we do that through knowing him based on who he says he is. When he says, I am love, I am joy, I am peace. If you are not experiencing those things, then you are not experiencing him. If you're experiencing fear, you are not experiencing Jesus, right? You're not experiencing the knowledge of him and grace and peace is not multiplied to you unless you know him. And when you know him, you know love, you know grace, you know joy, you know peace, you know patience because it's all in you, okay? And knowing him based on who he says he is and you experience him by that faith. So I can think about love and know I am love because he lives in me. I am him and he is me. And I'm experiencing love. And if I'm not experiencing that love on purpose by choosing and by faith, then I'm not experiencing him. And the more that you experience that love and that peace and that joy and that knowing of him and the knowledge of him and who you are and who he says you are, then that becomes a heart to heart experience relationship. And that's where the unity comes in. That's where the unified um, becoming one with him is. Okay. So let's look at the next scripture here. John 14, 10, he says, do you not believe that I am in the father? That's unity, right? And the father is in me. The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative, but the father abiding in me does his works. Okay. So here he's talking about unity again. He's talking about that being one with him. He's unified with the Father. He's saying, don't you believe that I'm unified with the Father? The Father is unified with me because the words that I'm speaking to you are not my words. They're his words. It's the Father who's abiding in me. It's the it's a Father that's in unity with me. Okay, you have to get this. You are not separate from God. We are not talking about a God who is out there and we are in here and we have to go get him and bring him in. Okay, God is within us. We are one with him. We are unified with him in spirit, in our bodies, in us, okay? So the words that come out of your mouth should be the words that come out of his mouth, okay? And the words that come out of his mouth should be the words that come out of your mouth because he should be abiding in you. And how do you abide? By being aware of him. It's awareness. It's being aware of him in you, okay? So let's look at John 10. I'm sorry, John 14, 10 in the Passion Translation. It says, don't you believe that the Father is living in me and that I am living in the Father? Even my words are not my own, but come from my Father, for he lives in me and performs his miracles of power through me. Okay, so does that sound like unity, right? They're co-creators. Jesus is saying he performs his miracles through me. I'm the conduit of which he performs his miracles through me. Okay. And so that's unity. That's the knowledge of God in him. He knew that God and him were one. He knew they were unified. So they walked in unity. They did things in unity. They were not separate. This is so critical to understand this unity. Okay. The oneness that you have. So let's look at John 17, 3. It says, now, this is eternal life, okay? Now, a lot of people think that eternal life is where you're going to go someday in heaven, but that's not what the scripture says. John 17, 3 says, now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So he's saying here that eternal life is to know God, is to know Jesus, is to know the truth the way and the life, to know the life that is in you, okay? Eternal life is in you right now. You're experiencing eternal life right now. In this realm, in this physical realm, you are experiencing eternal life right now. Because the word eternal in the Greek is 166, and it says life operates simultaneously outside of time, inside of time, and beyond time, okay? So eternal is where God resides. He resides where there is no time and space. He resides outside the physical realm. But we also reside in eternal life because our spirits live in eternity. 
we also experience outside of time, inside of time, and beyond time within us, in our spirits. Our physical bodies live on a day-to-day time scale, but our spirit in us does not. We operate outside of time in our spirits, okay? And that's a whole nother discussion about how that how you operate out of that um, in the spiritual realm, beyond time and outside of time and inside of time and all that. But let's just move on here. So I put here that thus believers live in eternal life right now, experiencing the quality of God's life now at a present possession. Okay. Actually, I believe that's part of the Greek explanation for eternal. So it's saying again that you're experiencing the quality of God's life right now. Right now, you're experiencing God's life. As you're listening to this, as you're watching this, you are experiencing eternal life. Okay. The question is, are you experiencing life in the physical realm or are you experiencing the spiritual life in the in the eternal realm? Okay, are you experiencing God in the spiritual realm and his love and his peace and his knowing and that awareness and of the relationship that you have with him, that you and him are one? Or are you experiencing the physical realm and the feeling of being separated? A lot of people say, I feel like God is not there. I feel like God is um, far away. Well, they are experiencing the physical realm at that point. You're not experiencing him because he's eternal and he's in you. Okay. And you and him are one in the spiritual realm and he's never separated from you ever. Okay. So let's look at the next scripture here. First John 5 20, I put, Um, And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true in his son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. So even John wrote uh, in 1 John 5 that we may know him. Again, it's that knowing that's experiencing him, right? And we know that the Son of God has come, that Jesus has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him. And he talked about him being true. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Okay, he is the true reality. Jesus walked out the true reality. And it says, and we are in him who is true. Again, Jesus is the true reality and we are inside of that true reality in the spirit. In his son, Jesus Christ, this is the true God and eternal life. Okay, so Jesus is eternal life because he is outside of time, inside of time, in eternal life. And we are in him, so we are experiencing eternal life with him. So let's, um, what I have here is his power was deposited in you. Okay, this is a recap of what I mentioned in the beginning. His power was deposited in you. As you experience him and are more aware of him, you gain more knowledge of his character, and this develops a deeper personal relationship with him. Okay, so this is the part you have to really grasp. The fact that his power was deposited in you and as you experience him, as you become more aware of him by faith, and when, and when I say by faith, it's merely saying, okay, God has deposited power within me. I may not feel it. I may not be able to hear it or know in any way, shape, or form that it's there. But I have to choose to believe on purpose that that power is in me like he said it is. As you experience him, as you become more aware of him, right, you will gain more knowledge. You will have more wisdom. You'll have that knowing about his character, about his love, and it will develop a deeper personal relationship with him, okay? And then I have here at the end that once this becomes your reality, then you are able to release his power more effectively by faith. So that power that is deposited in you, as you become more aware of that, the more that you become aware of it, the more knowledge that you gain, the more understanding that you become, um, or the more understanding that you that you uh, understand around this whole concept 
that he is with you always, that he's in you. Like Jesus said, it's unity. It's, I'm one with him. And once this becomes your reality, once you live in this realm, right? Once you live from the perspective that Jesus is in me, he's alive in me, then you're able to release his power more effectively by faith. Okay. What does that really mean? Okay. When I say that becomes your reality, let's look back at the scripture here. Jesus said, was it in 10? Yeah. John 14, 10. He said, do you not believe that I'm in the father and the father is in me? See, at this point, Jesus understood the reality. That was his reality that the father is in him and I'm in him and he is in me. And we walk in unity. We walk in oneness. Okay. There is no separation between me and God. We're one. Whatever I'm doing, he's doing. Whatever he's doing, I'm doing. Okay? And so once this becomes your reality, you're able to release his power more effectively by faith. You release it by believing that you're releasing his power through him. And as you know him and you have that personal relationship, it's much easier to release that by faith. Okay? So I hope this helps. If anybody has any comments, questions, please put them down below and I'll be happy to follow up. Blessings, guys. Thank you.